All right, so let's continue our discussion with frequency response and Bode plots. Um, in the previous lecture, we looked at uh, what we referred to as the seven fundamental uh, transfer functions, or the seven fundamental Bode plots. Uh, and the idea is, if you if you have a handle on how the Bode plots look for each of these seven fundamental transfer functions, then you are well equipped to begin sketching Bode plots for any arbitrary transfer function. Okay, so the goal of today's lecture is to uh, give you the tools to be able to uh, look at any transfer function and sketch the frequency response or the Bode plot uh, for that transfer function. So the main idea is that uh, any transfer function that you're given, uh, mathematically, it should be possible to factor, factor it down into a product of one or more of those seven fundamental transfer functions. So that was, that was the whole motivation for giving you that, that worksheet of those seven fundamental uh, transfer functions. And then the idea here is, all right, th this whole discussion begins with this argument that uh, by the nature of those seven fundamental transfer functions, you know, being what they are, it should be possible for any transfer function to be expressed as a product of those. Now if we're going to look at the frequency response for each one of these sort of individual transfer functions, the mathematical uh, step we need to take is to plug in j omega everywhere we see s. This will yield the frequency response function. And so for each of the simpler functions, we'll call those p sub i, for example. Right, so for each of these simpler transfer functions, if we look at the frequency response for it, we can write that complex valued uh, function in uh, exponential form. So just like we have in the past, we'll express this frequency response function as some uh, magnitude e to the j some phase angle. Okay, so this is just a complex valued function in exponential form where this r represents the magnitude and the phi represents the phase. Uh, so this is an exponential form. Okay, so the, the, the idea is basically this is for all, for i is equal to a, b, c, and so forth, which are, you know, these uh, simple transfer functions uh, that, that we were able to factor uh, the, the main transfer function into. Okay, so these are those, those seven, one or more of those seven simple transfer functions. And then the idea here is uh, the overall, the overall transfer function now. So this is the original, you know, big complicated, uh, you know, fifth order or seventh order transfer function. The original transfer function can then be written in a similar way, which is to say in exponential form. So we'll express this, we'll call this r bar, e to the j phi bar. Okay, so this is the original, you know, uh, higher order transfer function. To connect this notation to the simpler versions, we have the following. Uh, essentially, r bar, which represents the overall magnitude for the entire original transfer function, that's equal to the product um, of all of these individual uh, 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 frequency response functions. Uh, and the phase, right, the, the phi bar, which we'll, we'll call it phi bar, that's actually equal to the sum of all of the individual phases. So phi A plus phi B plus phi C, and so forth. Okay, so, so one is a product, and one is a sum which is actually nice for the phase, the phi bar, because phi, which is the phase function, uh, works out to be uh, the following. So we have that the total phase function for the original uh, uh, frequency response function, that ends up being, based on this uh, analysis, that ends up being just the individual phase uh, functions for each of the individual simpler transfer functions and so forth. Right? This is nice because this lends itself to graphical superposition uh, 
uh, of all of the phase plots for the individual transfer functions, which ultimately become the uh, overall phase plot, uh, the Bode phase plot for the original transfer function. The problem here is we can't do the same thing for our bar, right? Because our bar, right? So this is good. Our bar, which represents the magnitude, uh, let's see, our bar is R A, R R B, R C, so forth. This, uh, well, this does not lend itself very nicely to graphical superposition because it's a product, right? So what it means is we, if we want to take advantage of graphical superposition in order to sketch the Bode plots for more complex systems, we, we kind of need a workaround for this, right? And so the workaround is actually, actually to take the log of both sides. If you take the log of both sides of this equation, what you end up with is uh, the log of r bar is equal to uh, by the property of logarithms, this would equal the the log of the individual uh, magnitude functions. So it would be log of Ra plus log of Rb and so forth. Now this itself becomes a summation which uh, is is much more convenient when we're trying to do graphical superposition. Now remember that the log of R bar, this is actually just equal to the log of the overall Bode magnitude for the original transfer function, right? So we have essentially the Bode phase function here and the Bode magnitude function here. One is the actual function, right? It's just the phase of P of J omega, whereas the second is expressed as the log of the magnitudes. And they both end up being summations, which is going to ultimately benefit us when we're trying to do graphical superposition. Okay, so this, this little derivation right here, this is, well, it's one of the reasons that traditionally we place the Bode magnitude plot on a log-log scale, whereas the Bode phase plot is generally plotted on a semi-log scale. Okay, so what it means is we can go ahead and superimpose the phase plots directly on a linear scale, but if we want to do graphical superposition like this, for the magnitudes, we've got to take the log of the overall magnitude function. Okay, so let's look at an example of how we might apply this. Uh, what we're going to try and do is to sketch the Bode plot for this transfer function. 10 times s plus 1 over s plus 10. Now again, you always have the option to plug in s equals j omega, uh, which gives you the complex valued frequency response function. You can separate that into its real and imaginary counterpart and then apply the analytical formula for magnitude and phase, uh, which we covered in a previous lecture. But that takes a lot of time, there's a lot of algebra involved, and j sometimes we want to see the general shape of the Bode plot um, without drilling down into the specific analytical functions. Okay, So in order to do that, the first thing you want to do is to try and factor this out into a product of one or more of those seven fundamental transfer functions. Okay, So, so if we can make our Bode plot here, I'm sorry, if we can make this P of S here look like a product of one or more of these seven, then it's a matter of superimposing what we know to be the Bode plots for those simple transfer functions. Right? And that should give us the total uh, Bode plot. Okay, so what I what I see here is I can factor out, uh, well, there, the 10 can just stay. I've got an S plus 1 over 1 times now, if I'm just going to do pure factorization, it would be 1 over s plus 10, and I would call it a day. However, 1 over s plus 10, this is not of the form of one of those seven fundamental transfer functions. What I'm shooting for is a transfer function that looks like a over s plus a. So those two numbers have to be the same in order for me to use this. So I can put a 10 in the numerator here, as long as I compensate for that outside. Okay, So that's one... Uh, example of how you can use this factorization method. Now obviously I've chosen nice numbers here so that these constant values cancel, but that will not always be the case. 
Okay, so what we have here is the original transfer function factored down into two um, into two different uh, into two of those fundamental transfer functions. We'll give these names. We'll call this we'll call this P A, and we'll call this P B, and then we're just going to take this uh, incrementally. Okay, so we'll, we'll deal with the magnitude first. Let's see the magnitude first. So we're looking at the Bode magnitude. <coughs> okay, so we'll look at our Bode magnitude first, and we're just going to consider P sub A. We'll consider P sub A first, and if we look at our sheet, our sort of cheat sheet here, P sub A has a form of S plus A over A, which is fundamental transfer function number two. And so the property of fundamental transfer function number two is that it's got a magnitude of one up until the cutoff frequency of A, at which point the magnitude starts to increase at a slope of one decade uh, for every decade of frequency. Okay, so we're going to take an asymptotic approach first noting that A, or the cutoff frequency for P sub A, is 1, so right about here. So we're just going to sort of march along a magnitude of 1 before beginning to increase with a slope of 1 decade per decade uh, for all larger frequencies. Okay, so that's our asymptotic approximation for P A. Do the same thing for P B. The only difference with P sub B is that it's inverted. So instead of increasing, we decrease with the slope of negative one uh, decade per decade. But that starts at this cutoff frequency of 10. So again, we'll march along a magnitude of one until we hit that cutoff, and then decrease with the slope of minus one decade per decade. So this is our asymptotic magnitude approximation for P sub B. Sorry about that. Okay. Once you do that for all of your intermediate transfer functions, the next step is to generally produce the overall uh, asymptotic approximation, and then final step is to sketch in the overall Bode plot. What I mean by that is we can superimpose our, our uh, asymptotes here, <clears throat> and the only thing that you have to be careful about is you just have to remember that the magnitudes are still products, okay? We're just expressing them on a log-log scale such that we can take advantage of that graphical superposition. So when you're superimposing these asymptotes on the magnitude scale, you can do it one of two ways. You can go as the product of the two values, or you can superimpose the slopes. Okay, what I mean by that is, for all frequencies less than one, for example, the magnitude is a value of 10 to the 0 or 1. Now there's two asymptotes here, so that's two plots that we need to combine. If we take the product of those two, that's 1 times 1, that's going to give us a value of 1. So our total asymptot asymptotic approximation up until the frequency of 1 remains as 1. The other way to think about it is that, it's a pro uh, is that we can superimpose the slopes. Okay, so frequencies less than 1 have a slope of 0. There's two plots here that both have a slope of 0. 0 plus 0 is another slope of 0. That's another way to think about it. Uh, between frequency 1 and 10, okay, let's, let's treat this the same way, we have a, va a constant value of 1 multiplied by this slope, uh, which is the P sub A asymptote. Okay, so 1 times anything is just going to give us that same value back. So we're just going to traverse along the P sub A asymptote. The other way to think about it is that we're, uh, we're adding a slope of 1 to a slope of 0, which is going to give us a slope of 1. This uh, method applies to all frequencies. So frequencies larger than 10, one way to think about that is well, again, it's either the product of the two values, which begins to get a little bit harder to see, uh, or we can treat it as, again, a summation of the slope. So a slope of positive 1 plus a slope of negative 1 should give us a flat line. So we're back to a slope of 0 
And this is the asymptotic approximation for the original Bode magnitude plot. Okay, so once you have the total asymptote, then you can simply sketch in what the actual Bode plot would look like. Now we know for first order systems, we know for first order systems, if we were to look at what the Bode magnitude plots look like, they simply have a smooth roll off or a smooth transition from the zero slope to the negative one slope. So in both of the cases for, for, for these simple transfer functions, we can simply sketch in that smoother transition, like so, to get our total Bode plot. Okay, so as we uh, sort of populate the entire spectrum of frequencies. We just need to be careful about what's happening at these sort of cutoff frequencies. And for these first order transfer functions, it's a nice smooth uh, transition. Okay, so this green plot here, this becomes the total Bode magnitude plot for this original transfer function, uh, 10 times s plus 1 over s plus 10. Let's deal with the uh, phase plot now. The phase plot's arguably uh, much more straightforward. Okay, so for the phase plot, we're actually just doing simple graphical superposition. So there's no need to use asymptotic approximations like we did in the uh, magnitude scale, and there's no need to superimpose by the product or the slope by any means. And of course, that, that comes back to this mathematical derivation that the the overall Bode phase plot is simply a summation of the individual phase uh, plots. Okay, so what that means for us is we just need to take a look at, well, what does the Bode phase plot look like for P sub A and P sub B, and then just superimpose those. Okay, so for P sub A, we, we, have, uh, we have the form of S plus A over A. Well, the phase starts at zero ends at positive 90, passing through 45 degrees at the cutoff frequency. And for P sub B, we have the inverse of that. We should start at 0 and at negative 90, passing through negative 45 at that cutoff frequency. Okay, so we can actually go ahead and sketch in the Bode phase plot for P sub A, uh, which has a cutoff frequency of 1. That's where I should pass through uh, 45. Bode phase will look something like this and end at positive 90. For P sub B, uh, we're going to invert that, and we're also going to shift it a little bit to the right because of this cutoff frequency of 10. So I should pass through negative 45 at a, uh, at a frequency of 10 radians per second, like so. And that's the phase angle for P sub B. Okay. Now, when we go to superimpose these, it's the same as you would do for any graphical superposition. You're really just summing up the values at any frequency. Okay. So for all frequencies below, say, 0.1, we're just adding two phases of 0 and 0. So 0 plus 0 equals 0. For frequencies up until about this, according to how I've drawn it, up until about this frequency, there's still zero phase contribution from P B. In other words, we're going to follow along directly with P sub A, like so. Right? Because we're essentially adding the phase from PA to a phase value of zero. Now at some point here, we're going to start adding these sort of negative frequency components to this blue plot. And you can see as frequencies approach infinity, we're ultimately going to be adding 90 to negative 90. So ultimately we're going to end up back on a phase of zero, like so. And in the meantime, between this point and this point, we're simply subtracting off what we get from this uh, P sub B phase from the blue P sub A line, which ultimately ends up looking like this. Right, so this again is just a simple, straightforward graphical superposition. And ultimately, this is what our Bode phase plot for the original transfer function looks like. Okay, so again, the phase is simple uh, uh, superposition, whereas the Bode magnitude plot, we have to be a little careful because of how we are combining or how, we're, how we are superimposing the uh, 
the uh, magnitude plots for the individual transfer functions. Okay. So this process um, applies for any for any transfer function that that you can that you can see. Right. So the idea is we'll start simple and and base our superposition based on um, based on these arguments. Right. So we have the the magnitudes on a log log scale. The phase is on a semi log scale. And then the way to superimpose the magnitudes is a little bit tricky because you've got to go. Remember, you have to remember that it's essentially still a product, uh, but we're visualizing it on the log log scale so that the slopes become uh, a summation. Uh, but let's do the same type of thing for a slightly more complex example. So now what we're going to do is we're going to sketch the Bode plot for uh, this transfer function. Okay, so it appears that we have very quickly gone from a simple example to a very, very complicated example. Um, but I want what I want to illustrate to you is that the process, again, is identical. There's nothing more complicated about this other than that there's a little bit more uh, volume. There's just more stuff to do, but the process is the same. Uh, and again, that process is the first thing we want to do is to factor this down. Uh, into a product of those seven fundamental transfer functions. And so this is what we're going to get. Okay, so for each of the each of the transfer functions, I wrote it in terms of the form that you would expect to see on our sheet of fundamental transfer functions. In other words, for this s squared plus 40s plus 10,000, First of all, I wrote the numerator as plus 100 squared because it's second order. So I'm identifying omega n as 100. That's the value being squared. I also put that same value in the denominator because that's what the form of that tra transfer function looks like. Notice here and here. Omega n appears as a constant value in the numerator and the denominator. But I also compensated so that I didn't change the original function. So if I divided by 100 squared, I also multiplied by 100 squared. And that's consistent for all of the transfer functions down the line. Now it turns out that all of these constant values, uh, thankfully, ultimately will cancel. So this will cancel with this and this and this. Um, and so we get to just sort of focus on the four main transfer functions that we have to deal with here. Now one thing that does change with this problem with respect to the first problem is that now we're dealing with second order transfer functions. And anytime we're dealing with second order systems, we always need to check those to see if there's a resident peak or an anti-resident peak. Okay, so for for P sub B, the form of this transfer function is of P sub 4 in our fundamental transfer functions sheets, which means that it's either going to have an anti-resident peak or it's not. And we need to check by uh, comparing the value of zeta to root 2 over 2. Okay, so if zeta is less than root 2 over 2, we will expect to see an anti-resident peak. And for P sub D, we've got a form of P sub 3, which is to have the second order polynomial in the denominator. What we're checking here is to see if there's a resident peak or not. So again, the, the check is the same mathematically. You're just seeing if zeta is less than root 2 over 2. Uh, for P sub 4, the check is to see whether or not there's an anti-resident peak. For P sub 3, the check is to see whether or not there's a resident peak. Okay, so we, we need to check zeta for both of these values. Okay, and the way to do that is to compare uh, the given transfer function to the general form. Okay, so once you compare this to the general form, you can equate coefficients. 100 squared is equal to omega n squared, which gives us omega n is 10. And then now you can compare 40 to 2 zeta times omega n, which we know is equal to 10, to find that zeta is equal to 0.2. Zeta equals 0.2 is less than root 2 over 2, so indeed we should expect to see 
an anti-resident peak. Okay, we can do the same thing for P sub D. And what we're going to find, again, is that zeta is less than root 2 over 2. So for P sub D, we should expect to see a resonant peak. Okay, so these are going to come into play a little bit later. But the first thing we want to do is to sketch out our uh, asymptotic approximation for the magnitude. And then from there, we can incorporate these resonance, uh, resonances into that Bode plot. Okay, so let's do what we did before. Uh, consider all four of these fundamental transfer functions and, and start with the magnitude and look at their individual Bode plots. Okay, so the first one we'll consider is P sub A, which has the form of uh, fundamental transfer function number two. For this asymptotic approximation, S plus one over one, we should expect to have a, a magnitude of 1 all the way until the cutoff frequency, at which point we would increase with the slope of positive 1 decade per decade. And this is our asymptotic approximation for P sub A. For P sub B, we expect to see second order numerator, we should see a magnitude of 1 until the cutoff frequency of 100, at which point we will see a slope of positive 2 decades per decade. So this, the slope here is going to be steeper for P sub B. The slope there is going to be 2 decades per decade. P sub C, uh, this is the inverse of P sub A. We're going to see uh, attenuation or a roll-off in the magnitude starting at a frequency of 0.1. So we are going to track along a magnitude of 1 until 0.1, at which point we are going to decrease our amplitude. at a slope of minus 1 decade per decade. This is our P sub C magnitude plot. And finally, our P sub D magnitude plot is going to have a slope of negative 2 decades per decade, starting at a frequency of 10, like so. Let's see. So. like so. So a slope of minus two decades per decade there. Okay, what we need to do now that we have all of our asymptotic approximations is we want to superimpose all of those to give ourselves the total Bode magnitude uh, asymptote and then we'll go back and incorporate the resonance into that entire Bode plot. Okay, so what I mean by that is let's just get our asymptote first up until a frequency of 0.1, we're basically multiplying 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, or we're adding four slopes of 0. So our overall asymptote is just horizontal. Between 0.1 and 1, the only contribution is due to this minus 1 decade per decade slope. Okay, so it's like we're adding three zeros to 1 negative 1. Between 1 and 10, we're getting contributions from positive 1 slope from P sub A, as well as still the negative slope from P sub C, which means our slopes are going to cancel. So we're going to end up with a slope of, ne of 0 between these frequencies. So now between frequencies of 10 and 100, uh, we still got the positive 1 and the negative one contribution, but those essentially cancel each other out. So now we're just uh, superimposing a slope of zero with the slope of negative two, according to P sub D. Okay. 
like so. And then for all frequencies greater than 100, the only thing left that's got any contribution is this positive 2 slope from P sub B, which is ultimately going to cancel with the negative 2 slope from P sub D. While we still have the positive 1 and the negative 1 slope from P sub A and P sub C canceling as well, so all frequencies larger than 100, we should expect to see 0 slope. And this becomes the Bode magnitude appro asymptotic approximation for the original transfer function. Okay, um, Hopefully the reason we use this asymptotic approximation will become apparent because now what we have to do is go ahead and uh, sketch in the actual Bode plot. Right, the, the, the asymptote is just sort of where the Bode plot is going to exist, but we actually need to recognize that the Bode plot has no sharp corners like this. We've got to go ahead and fill in the actual Bode plot. And the way we're going to do that is to examine why each one of these transitions occurred. In other words, the transition from a slope of 0 to negative 1 at a frequency of 0.1 occurred because of P sub C, right? The cutoff frequency for this one said we will start attenuating at a frequency of 0.1. Well, first-order transfer functions never have resonant or anti-resonant peaks, so we can expect that that transition is just going to be nice and smooth. Right? It's going to reflect that of the fundamental transfer function Bode plot. For the second one, so the second transition occurs at a frequency of 1, and that was due to the cutoff frequency in P sub A. P sub A is again a first order transfer function, so we should expect to see just a smooth transition from a slope of negative 1 back to horizontal. Okay, now here's where things get a little bit interesting. The reason we go from a slope of 0 to negative 2 uh, at a frequency of 10 is because of the cutoff frequency of P sub D. And P sub D was a second order transfer function, which we determined by computing zeta that it will have a resonant peak at that frequency. So the way to express that on your Bode plot is not a smooth roll off from 0 to a slope of negative 2. We have to show that resonant peak occur right here, like so. Okay, so we know that there's going to be a little bit of a resonant peak that exists right there at that frequency. And then finally, the slope transition from negative 2 to 0 at a frequency of 100 occurred because of this cutoff frequency at P sub B. P sub B was also determined to have an anti-resonant peak that exists. So we need to go ahead and sketch that in as well anti-resonant peak means that we actually attenuate more than expected before returning to sort of the asymptotic approximation. Okay, so we're going to we're going to sketch those features in onto our Bode plot. And then for all higher frequencies we expect uh, the magnitude to level out at some final value. Okay, so this is uh, this solid green line now becomes the overall Bode magnitude plot for the original transfer function up here. Okay, that was the you know this this part is the the trickier part, having to check for resonances and recognizing and identifying where those resonances exist on the spectrum of frequencies in your Bode plot. Uh, the phase, okay, the phase, again, is arguably much more straightforward. So we'll wrap things up by sketching in the phase here. Okay, so for the Bode phase, it's just a matter of revisiting our simple transfer functions one more time. P sub A has the form of fundamental transfer function 2. So we should start at a phase of 0, increase to a phase of 90, passing through 45 at the cutoff frequency of 1. So down here, that's going to look like this. Again, we're going to pass through 45 at about that cutoff frequency and end at positive 90. Uh, 
like so. This becomes our phase for P sub A. And we can go ahead and do the same thing for all of the transfer functions as well. The one thing I will note is that for second order transfer functions, for example, PB, according to our fundamental list of transfer functions, that should start at zero, okay? The phase should start at zero and end up at positive 180, passing through 90 degrees at the cutoff frequency. However, the cutoff frequency is defined as omega n, right? Whereas normally we're used to seeing something like, you know, s plus s squared plus 40 s plus 10,000. For second order systems, you have to remember that this coefficient here represents omega n squared. So it's the thing that's being squared that's the actual cutoff frequency. In other words, we are not going to go to a frequency of 10,000 before we start going up. Uh, passing through positive 90. We're going to pass through 90 at a frequency of 100. Okay, So just be, be careful of that for second order systems. And for P sub B, that's going to look like well, we start at 0, pass through 90 at a frequency of 100. So it'll look something like this. That's our P sub B. P sub C is the other way. We're going to go from 0 to negative 90, passing through 45 at point 0.1. I'm sorry, we're going to pass through negative 45 at point 0.1. Did I get that right? Ah, okay, so I realize I made an error on the first plot, the yellow plot. This yellow plot should be passing through 45 at 1, whereas the magenta plot should be passing through negative 45 at 0.1. So let's, let's reflect that on our Bode phase plot. Like so. Uh, this was 1 here. So, there we go. Okay, so that's our P sub A. And then finally, we've got P sub D, which uh, we've got a cutoff frequency of 10, and we should be going from 0 to negative 180. So let's pass through negative 90 at a frequency of 10, like so. P sub D. Okay, so now remember the phase uh, is a lot is more straightforward. So we just need to superimpose all of these graphically. There's no addition according to the sums, and it's not a product. Okay, so any frequency below about this frequency, uh, the phase all are all zero. Okay, between this frequency and roughly this frequency, we only see a phase contribution according to the pink plot. So we're going to follow that. Between this frequency and roughly this frequency, we see, okay, we're going to start to divert away from that according to the P sub A phase plot. So we're going to, going to start to add some phase back, like so. We're going to start to add some phase back, so we're going to divert away from the pink plot. And if you think about what's happening with P sub A, okay, did I, P sub A, and this should be P sub C, those phases will eventually cancel out themselves out, and we should return to zero. Okay, so if there were nothing else, this phase plot would just continue back to zero. But because now we've got the introduction of P sub D, which is a uh, subtracting phase, we need to take that into account as well. So we're going to start subtracting our phase back, like so, until we hit roughly this frequency where we're going to start to add that phase back from P sub B. Now P sub A and P sub C will eventually cancel and so will P sub B and P sub D because that's 180 minus 180. So ultimately at this point here we're going to start to add this component back and we know that eventually we're going to return to a phase of zero degrees.
So right back on the the axis here. Okay, so this becomes our overall Bode phase plot. Okay, and this is again is just graphical superposition, uh, as as I'm sure you've seen before. Okay, so as we move forward with this concept, we're going to start to look at some examples where uh, previously they would have been impossible because these examples that we'll look at are not just your simple first or second order transfer functions. Uh, they generally depict systems that have more complex dynamics and their transfer functions, as most transfer functions are, will be um, products of, of those seven simpler transfer functions. So. Um, we'll end this lecture here, but just realize that we now have the ability to analyze um, more complicated and more realistic systems, which we'll start to do in the next lectures.